Hi, my name is Stephen Bryant, and I want to welcome you to episode 22 of the RelativityChallenge.com podcast. In this podcast, we're going to look at a presentation I recently delivered at the 18th annual NPA conference that was held in 2011 at the University of Maryland. We're going to cover a lot of topics in this episode, so it's going to be one of our longer ones. But at the end, we hope to show and introduce a new model called Modern Classical Mechanics that will be over 100 times more accurate than, special, than the special relativity equations. We also will show and explain some of the terms that may have been confusing from a relativistic perspective, like the twin paradox, time dilation, and length contraction, and explain what they are, why they're required by relativity, and why they're not required by modern classical mechanics. The first thing we need to do is understand the function and role of models and theories in science. And I, I extend that to say science and engineering. And the real purpose are either to explain things or to predict things. Now, models and theories don't have to be perfect. The key thing is that they are good enough to be useful. And this is a key distinction that I think is very, very important, and I think it is one that most scientists and engineers recognize, which is that you can operate with a model or a theory that's not 100% accurate and doesn't explain everything, but it's good enough for our work. Now, this creates a, an opportunity for new models to be introduced. When new models are introduced, there is a couple of different schools of thought as to how paradigm shifts occur. One, which was advocated by Max Planck, is that the old guard has to die or move on. The second, advocated by Thomas Kuhns, is that people will believe logical, rational arguments. And as you'll see shortly, both of these, while partially true, are not enough. In fact, when we look at the old guard, what happens is we have examples of this occurring all of the time, where existing professors or recognized experts may retire or simply stop teaching. And what we found through our experience is that there's always students or new graduates or other followers who are expert in that particular subject matter who are willing to step in and be guardians of the prevailing model. So just because an existing guardian moves on, that alone is not going to be enough. How about when we look at logical arguments? Well, last year I presented a logical argument that I call the failure of Einstein's spherical wave proof. And in this proof, we show that Einstein says you start with a spherical wave, you go through some mathematics to conclude that you have a spherical wave. And if you've done this step, this proof correctly, this is what establishes relativity theory. And what we found is that by looking at the equations alone and, and not recognizing all of the requirements that are required to be a sphere or a spherical wave, you could reach a false positive conclusion. The correction, as we talked about in the last episode, is to simply perform an additional check to see if the radius is the same for all of our points. And if that's the case, then we know we have a valid sphere or circle. And if that fails, then we know we didn't. When we look at Einstein's derivation and we put some real numbers in there, uh, we find that by just checking against the equations, which is what Einstein did in his proof, he was able to conclude in a false positive manner that he had a sphere. And in fact, this has been the prevailing interpretation for the past century. What we found is just the addition of that check, do all the points have the same radius, we find that a sphere was not formed and the proof actually failed. And you'll see this in the table on the far right, where we have at least three different radius values shown there which means we don't have a sphere. So when we consider Einstein's proof, we find that the proof actually failed. So this is a logical argument where it failed. However, over the past year, I've received three types of, of arguments uh, against this um, proof or this analysis. One 
claims that Einstein never says you're going to end with a spherical wave, or they say that he never begins with one. So they basically ignore aspects of Einstein's proof. The second says, well, it's true if you consider it from a relativistic perspective. And again, the counter, the, the point there is they're applying relativity before you've established relativity. The third and most important one was when people say, well, he talked about a sphere in this paper, but he really should be talking about a hypercone since that's the shape he talks about in his future works. And that is a valid argument that we need to talk about because as an author, I know that your ideas that you may write one year may change and morph as time progresses. So as we look at the hypercone, we have to begin with a quiz. And when we look at this, the quiz reads, you're moving at 10 miles per hour, have been traveling for some number of hours, let's say two. Which of the following is used to measure the product of your velocity multiplied by the amount of time you've been traveling? And your choices are a ruler, a clock, a scale, and a bucket. Most people will answer this, a ruler, because velocity multiplied by time is always a distance. Now in a moment, some people will want to change their answer to a clock. So in order to understand why that might be the case, we have to look at the power of beliefs. And in this case, we're going to look at an illustration of Einstein's hypercone. And in this case, the only thing I want to point out is the vertical axis, which is labeled L. That's the one axis we want to understand. Now, first, in order to understand this, we need to first anchor ourselves in something that we know is true. Distance equals velocity times time. Now we look at Einstein's work. And when we read his book, we find that he treats L in his hypercone derivation as a time variable. And we know that from the statements that he makes where he refers to it as time, or he characterizes it with clocks or, 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 or with beats. So these are all things that Einstein says as he's describing L. Now, the way he creates L is with a simple brush stroke that is really intended as a substitution for convenience. He really doesn't want CT floating around in his derivation. So he says, I'm just going to replace that with L and continues with his work. The problem is with that simple brush stroke, he did not realize that L is not just a replacement. It is actually a distance. So in his derivation where he starts talking about time, he should be talking about length. And as a result, the analysis and the theoretical underpinnings about time are not completely accurate. Now, I've been able to show this, and it's a real simple derivation to show, or a real simple proof to show that L is actually a distance. Now, some folks, some people will continue to believe that L represents time, even in the face of this evidence. So how do changes happen? Well, changes happen when I think two things occur. One is you have a new model that's more intuitive and produces better math results. Now, it doesn't need to do both of those, but ideally, for a paradigm shift to be successful, it should do both of those. Second, the new model is supported by a group of experts in that new model and who are expert in the old model. If they're not expert in the old and the new, it's real hard to convince people to move to the new model or the new paradigm. So our goal today is to introduce the model, the modern classical mechanics model, explain why it produces better experimental results, explain why it's easier and more intuitive to understand, and help use it to help us explain things about relativity theory that the experts in relativity today themselves would have difficulty answering.